Okay, so tonight's lecture um, is is a combination of things, uh, and I and I put these things together because I personally see a connection uh, between addiction, eating disorders, and cutting. Now, at first, you might not see the connection, but after I've worked with many, many individuals, I started naturally uh, using similar treatments. And, um, and I'll tell you about that. Um, interestingly enough, about five years ago, they started uh, writing some journal articles on the addictive nature of eating disorders. And um, I haven't read any personally on cutting, but one of my students said they had seen one. Um, so we have um, an entire required class on addiction for clinical mental health students. Um, school counseling students can take addiction uh, as an elective. And then we also have a certificate program on addictions, and that includes uh, gambling addictions, advanced uh, treatment for addictions. Um, and I also have a personal a class that I personally teach uh, on uh, opioid addiction specifically. Um, so the first thing that I'd like to do is to just talk about um, the cycle of using uh, an addiction. And then uh, I'm not going to focus a lot on uh, substance addiction um, because you can, you're going to have an entire class on that. Um, or you can take a certificate on it. I'm going to talk about this cycle of addiction, but then uh, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, substance addiction and then move on to eating disorders and cutting. Um, the, uh, the one thing I would like to say is that, yes, uh, individuals can be diagnosed with um, nine or ten different uh, types of addiction in the DSM uh, substances. Um, I have quite often I have found that uh, substance abuse is comorbid with another diagnosis. Um, now it varies. Uh, it could be self-medication. The other diagnosis could have come first and then addiction, or addiction could have led to a secondary uh, diagnosis. So the first, you know, comorbid diagnosis could come first, and then that could lead to addiction, or addiction could come first, and that could lead to a comorbid diagnosis. It can go either way, um, but I often find that addiction is not alone. Uh, as far as diagnosis. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. This will take me a second. Okay, so hopefully you are seeing um, this diagram. <coughs> All right, so I usually draw a diagram on the board in a classroom, and uh, it looks like a bell curve. Um, but, uh, you know, 
these cycles repeat themselves, so a circle is probably more appropriate. I like I like seeing it on a, a bell curve because um, I see uh, I, I see it as rising and falling. Um, so let's let's talk about this, and I'll try to describe both types of of charts. It's but they're the same thing basically. So we'll start at the top, the emotional trigger. Let's say someone has found a way to deal with whether it be anxiety or um, so the emotional aspect of an addiction, also the physical aspect. So if somebody's using a substance and the body has grown uh, reliant on that substance to maintain some level of homeostasis, um, you're going to get a physical need. Um, but uh, there is also that emotional component uh, always. Um, and sometimes uh, that is just as powerful. So um, if things begin, let's say somebody's uh, at the bottom and they're feeling okay, you know, uh, but then, you know, they haven't used in a while or had a drink or whatever it is, and, um, you know, their body's just beginning a little bit of withdrawal, and uh, something happens to cause them anxiety. And uh, so we call that an emotional trigger. So the combination of the physical need, withdrawal, causing them physical discomfort and an emotional trigger starts moving them up that curve and it becomes uh, a craving, okay? So I picture cravings as a kind of a physical need, um, you know, um, with each child, my wife had different cravings, you know. Uh, well, I think uh, this is a specific craving, but um, it is a craving for whatever the substance that the person uses uh, is. So we have a physical craving. We also have... Um, an imagined relief, okay? Uh, while I'm feeling this anxiety, I've had this emotional trigger, maybe a boss yelled at me, or there is stress at work, or stress in a relationship, and combined with that physical need, um, I'm becoming more anxious. Uh, and I know it's more than just anxiety. I understand that. I'm just trying to use the best word as I can. So we move to physical craving, but also emotional need and fantasy of relief. So we have an imagined relief. If I use, I will find relief, both physical and emotional. So the physical relief, um, other than, you know, uh, this person may not be going through severe withdrawal symptoms, but um, right now it is a chemical relief, usually a brain chemical. It starts with brain chemicals. So raising serotonin, uh, you know, uh, dopamine, all kinds of different chemicals. Um, but... So we're moving up, we're, we're getting closer to using. And uh, the next stage is, and this is what I find to be extremely interesting, every single uh, addiction has a ritual. And um, it could be as simple as having a Zippo lighter. Everybody knows the sound 
uh, of a of a Zippo lighter. Okay, so you get the idea. All right, that that just that sound probably threw an image in your mind if you could hear it. I put it close to the uh, the microphone. Um, so it could be a ritual of if you're a smoker, you could uh, think about going down to the Seven uh, Eleven. You probably know the guy at the counter. Um, and uh, they might even know what brand of cigarette you smoke. Um, Americans uh, hit the pack of cigarettes against their palm to uh, pack that tobacco tighter. Uh, Europeans are a little smarter. Uh, they actually roll the cigarette in their fingers and loosen the tobacco uh, because the more oxygen that gets into the tobacco, the faster the fire will burn and the larger hit of nicotine you'll get. So it's, uh, it's a little different process, but it, either way, it's still a ritual. Pull the wrapper off that pack of cigarettes. Uh, maybe there are Marlboros, uh, maybe Marlboro Light. And, uh, you know, you smell the tobacco, as soon as you take that uh, plastic wrapper off and then you take the, uh, the paper or foil off and uh, smack it against your finger and one cigarette pops out, you take that cigarette out, put it in your mouth, flick the Zippo, you hear the sound, you smell the lighter fluid, you flick it, and you've got your hit of nicotine. So that's just one example. Every single thing, whether it's a drink of alcohol, uh, you know, whatever your favorite alcohol might be, it could be um, using uh, heroin, you know, the whole ritual of preparing that heroin, um, you know, uh, so all of these rituals happen in individuals' minds before they actually happen in real life. So when people get that craving, physical, or that emotional desire, and they begin fantasizing about using, the next step is they fantasize about the ritual process. And I found that when people get to fantasizing about the ritual itself, it's very hard for them to stop the process. They can stop at the initial craving, and they could technically stop imagining the ritual, but it's much harder once they get to that stage. And then they simply follow through with the ritual and use, then using is at the very top, the peak of that uh, bell curve. They use, uh, then they get that chemical intake and the anxiety and craving is relieved, and then they're quickly down the other side at the bottom of that curve, and then they feel guilty for using, and then the entire cycle begins again. So, that is a typical discussion in any addictions course. Um, it's, we teach clients that as well. They have to understand, well, what is the cycle of addiction? Why does it happen over and over again? 
Um, how do we break that cycle? Okay. Um, so let's, let's skip ahead. Let's move beyond substance use. Okay. And let's, let's talk about eating disorders. And I know you think I might be switching course here a little bit, but I'll connect it. All right. So when I started my very first, first um, time at a uh, at an agency um, it was uh, a general counseling service um, we saw any kind of diagnosis and uh, I had a very good um, supervisor and she uh, would always talk about our cases and supervision. Um, and she would assign us clients. And uh, she assigned me a client with an eating disorder. Well, of course, I was new. And I knew that eating disorders um, could uh, be life-threatening. And so I went to my supervisor and I said, you know, I don't have experience in treating eating disorders. We covered it in our DSM class and a couple other classes, but, you know, that doesn't mean I'm an expert in it. I, I knew my own limits. So, uh, you know, being a good supervisor, she gave me some choices. She said I could refer, um, she said that the client had been to a physician and she was not at a life-threatening stage of an eating disorder. Um, and uh, if uh, she was in danger, then we would make sure she got uh, appropriate help. Um, whether it be at a hospital with a physician, you know, a specialist, something like that. Um, she said she could give me ongoing weekly supervision um, and training. And so I accepted that and the client, and I'm glad I did. Um, so uh, let's talk about a differential diagnosis with the various types of eating disorders. So anorexia nervosa, characterized by a refusal to maintain a minimal, uh, no, minimally normal body weight. To determine if one is significantly underweight, it is suggested that clinicians calculate a body mass index of BMI that can be compared to normative data gathered by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a BMI below 17 kilograms, uh, calculated as weight in kilograms, height in meters, uh, indicates significant low weight. So subtypes, um, and you're always going to have to pick one. So restricting type. So that is the most common uh, type of anorexia. Weight loss is accomplished primarily through dieting, fasting, or excessive exercise. Individual is not engaged in binge eating or purging. Um, and then there's binge eating purging type anorexia. So the individual has regularly engaged in binge eating or purging or both during a current episode. Note the difference between anorexic and bulimic binge eating is that anorexics decrease body weight as a result, whereas bulimics typically maintain their body weight. So this is a new subtype, um, and I find it confusing for many. You can tell what the difference is here. However, um, I think it could 
I would have rather made anorexia, uh, weight loss, um, through dieting, fasting, excessive exercising, or purging. Uh, however, there is not a lack of weight gain or binge eating. So that's how I used to remember these, but now it's a little more complicated. Um, so I feel that binge eating and purging used to be more bulimia nervosa. So I still kind of carry that thought, that understanding in my mind, um, but it's neither here nor there. Bulimia, characterized by repeated episodes of binge eating, followed by inappropriate compensatory behaviors such as self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, diuretics or other medications, fasting or excessive exercise. In most cases, they are able to maintain appropriate body weight. So body weight is really a differential here. Um, purging behaviors, the person has regularly engaged in self-induced vomiting or misuse of laxative diuretics or enemas during a current period, current episode. Non-purging behaviors, uh, the person has used other inappropriate compensatory behaviors such as fasting or excessive exercise, but is not regularly engaged in self-induced vomiting or misuse of laxative diuretics or enemas during the current episode. Individuals suffering from these disorders may also show symptoms of depression, anxiety, some substance abuse. There is usually a comorbid diagnosis of either anxiety or depression. Um, not always. Anorexia and bulimia usually begin in adolescence or early adult life. Eating disorders have been determined to run in families. Females are four to 11 times more likely to develop an eating disorder that have had a first degree relative with the disorder. Twin studies indicate that the heritability of anorexia is between 48% uh, and 74% and of bulimia, 59 to 83%. That's pretty high. Um, lifetime prevalence of anorexia among females between 0.5 and 1%, less than 0.3 among males. Lifetime prevalence of bulimia among women is between 1.5% and 4%, less than 0.5 among males. Treatment, hospitalization is often required to restore weight, to address fluid and electrolyte balances. Combination of medication and therapy is recommended. So let's talk about this. Um, let's see. Uh, just thinking where to begin. Um, one of the fastest growing uh, populations for anorexia or bulimia um, happens to be uh, homosexual males, um, but that is closely followed uh, by heterosexual males. Um, only the, uh, the means by which they accomplish this is usually a little different. Um, yes, uh, so anorexia, um, you know, there is usually an incorporation of a lot of um, compensation and exercise and extreme dieting. So, um, <clears throat> for many males, it is, they, they would categorize it as non-purging bulimia because um, weight uh, and muscle mass can actually increase and yet not to a healthy level. So, Let's talk about the process. What happens?
most early studies uh, talk about um, the influence of media, um, magazine pictures, models, uh, Barbies, um, this uh, emphasis to look a certain way in our culture um, in order to be accepted or to be found attractive. And uh, so at first, um, all of these messages that individuals are getting um, connects our minds cognitively with external acceptance based on conditions. In order to be loved and accepted, I must look a certain way. Um, and so people begin to change themselves in order to be accepted. Uh, and But eventually that irrational thought is turned inward in order for me to accept myself I must meet certain conditions so you see it begins as this external expectation um, and it all goes back to uh, that that concept of unconditional love and acceptance which we all deserve versus conditional love and acceptance. In this case, the conditions are physical appearance. Um, so I believe that there is still a large component to that. If, if you just look on Instagram, which is pretty tame, uh, half the pictures I see are about people working out or doing something to look better. Um, so, um, so let's talk about what happens next though, because this, this second part was really not discussed until much, much later. Okay. So let's say somebody does start to, uh, diet and work out and, possibly purge or use laxatives or by whatever means or combination of means. And um, let's say they, they lose a little weight, enough that they have to buy a few new outfits and they go into work or school or they go out with friends and everybody starts to compliment them. Oh, you've been working out, you on a diet, you're looking good. Um, and so all of their uh, efforts are rewarded. And with those external rewards, they find more acceptance and approval. And, uh, you know, that stimulates brain chemicals, you know? They're, they're feeling better psychologically. And, you know, there's a little more serotonin going on there. Um, so they keep doing it, you know? So it's almost like operant conditioning, you know? Even classical conditioning, a little bit of both. So, um, so they continue and uh, as they lose more weight, they find more compliments and acceptance. And uh, they also begin to feel better about themselves. There is a cycle that begins to be created, especially with purging and binge eating. Um, there's a cycle, uh, anorexia less so. There's more of a... Um, controlled uh, schedule 
I can only eat so many calories. I can, I have to exercise, you know, and uh, so that brings us to the next thing, whether it's ritual or controlled schedule, control becomes part of this, the concept of control. Because when people were not feeling good about themselves or not accepted, uh, they also did not feel as though they had any control. Um, so let's talk about this concept of unconditional versus conditional love and acceptance. People um, may enter into a relationship and feel rejected if that doesn't work out. And uh, they might, so in order to love, we have to allow, we have to take a risk and become vulnerable and take a chance of getting hurt. Okay. However, once we're rejected once or twice or more than that, and things aren't working out, we don't want to experience that rejection or pain. So we build up emotional barriers or walls. And um, we also begin to control ourselves, our relationships, uh, the way we look. That sense of control helps us to feel more secure. Like if I'm in control, I'm not going to get hurt. We're also not taking the same risk and allowing ourselves to become vulnerable so we never fully experience other. We never fully allow ourselves to be loved or love others because we don't want to give up control. We don't want to take that ultimate leap, that risk, that leap of faith, and allow ourselves to become totally vulnerable. But it is only with total trust and vulnerability that we can experience complete love or that we can love others. So it's this love and acceptance cycle, this, this need for control that also comes into play with any eating disorder. And there are uh, very uh, precise um, cycles uh, in bulimia that resemble the cycle of addiction. Um, and there's also a heightened uh, schedule and sense of control in anorexia. Now, as these become more a part of people's lives, uh, they go to extremes. So rather than just maintaining a healthy lifestyle, being fit and uh, maintaining a healthy body mass index, things like that, they go to an extreme. And uh, it changes the way we think about ourselves cognitively. And so, for instance, uh, I might have a client um, draw a life-sized picture of themselves, an outline of their body, what they think they look like. And then um, they stand against that and I outline their actual uh, body and um, they, they can step back and they can see that their perception of self sees themselves as much larger than their actual self in reality. Um, I also go into other things. We don't only talk about eating. We talk about everything else that goes into that as well. Perception of self, acceptance of self, vulnerability, uh, being rejected, fear of rejection, unconditional love and acceptance, positive regard, the whole thing. We can't just talk about eating or lack of eating. That never works. We have to deal with this underlying uh, issue 
and the cycles and the control and everything else that goes into life that contributes to that need for control or uh, conditional acceptance rather than feeling that an individual deserves unconditional love and acceptance. Okay, treatment, that's, that's what I talk about in therapy, but it is very important that you coordinate with a physician that has experience with eating disorders and a nutritionist. Uh, we also have to be aware that um, we have to screen for suicidal ideation regularly. We have to um, coordinate with that physician because if there is any physical danger, uh, they need to be hospitalized. The client needs to be hospitalized. Okay. Um, I use a lot of REBT. Uh, and existentialism. The REBT deals with irrational thoughts and uh, the existentialism deals with love, acceptance, uh, choices, uh, and personal meaning. People uh, end up uh, finding meaning in the process of however they deal with food or weight or whatever it is. But that is a substitution for real meaning. And we want to make that transition from finding fulfillment through this disorder to a healthy meaning and fulfilling life. All right. I would like to talk about cutting as well. One of the things that I've noticed is um, when I was last practicing a few years ago, uh, I noticed younger and younger individuals uh, being referred uh, for self-harm. I also noticed that even though eating disorders didn't stop, um, often they were accompanied by self-harm and it was usually cutting. I noticed there were two different types of cutting. Uh, one was cutting in places that would get attention and other, others were cutting and hiding it. So people who are cutting as a cry for help, um, that is a different type of therapy, I would say, because they want help. Um, those who cut and hide it, it's much more difficult uh, to deal with those issues in therapy because there is shame and guilt and all kinds of other things involved with that. And it's also, both types are very dangerous because anytime you're cutting yourself with something sharp, it could be life-threatening. So you also want to consult with a physician and screen for suicidal ideology, uh, ideation. All right, so I think the biggest thing, think about that cycle of addiction, okay? Um, at some point, they either heard from somebody else about cutting or it happened by accident. Okay, so imagine um, people are experiencing anxiety and worry and fear and all kinds of emotions that we don't want to experience. But if for some reason, maybe I'm working on a, a construction project and I, I cut myself, I'm no longer thinking about all of those negative thoughts. 
I'm, I'm thinking about the immediate pain of the injury. Now, along with any injury, um, there are all types of chemical reactions in our brain. First of all, there's pain, which shifts our focus from the past, depression, future, anxiety, worries, and it shifts our minds into the present and we're no longer thinking about all those other things, if only for a moment. Pain does that. It creates a little boost of adrenaline and uh, it's like, hey, we got to take care of this injury. And um, there's also boosts of other chemicals after that. Okay, so um, cortisone and, uh, you know, other chemicals are then boosted in the brain. And it helps us to cope with that injury. And uh, so the combination of brain chemicals and the shift of focus from either depression or anxiety or worries away from those negative thoughts into the present moment is an immediate relief psychologically and emotionally. If only for a short, short time. But sometimes psychological pain is so severe that even hurting oneself physically is preferable to the emotional experience. I always say, uh, you know, people ask, well, why would people want to kill themselves or commit suicide? And I found that the answer is that they don't really want to end their life. They want to escape emotional pain. And the only outlet they see left to them is suicide. So when we think about that cycle of addiction, there is almost always a ritualized process in people who uh, cut or self-harm for an extended period of time. One example would be a client that wears long sleeves, long pants all the time, even in the summer, to cover up the injuries. Um, is experiencing depression or anxiety or both or something else, perhaps abuse. Um, and, uh, you know, when they're feeling really discouraged and overwhelmed, when something in life triggers them and pushes them over the edge, uh, they can go home, lock their door to their room, reach under their bed, pull out cigar box, might be decorated, stickers, uh, drawings, open it up. There's many things that they find comfort in, memorabilia, trinkets that they have collected at different places. And then uh, there may be a Zacto knife or razor blade or something like that, along with uh, some Neosporin, some alcohol, and alcohol is good. It not only disinfects, but it causes a little more sting. It makes it last a little longer. Um, so cotton, alcohol, neosporin. Um, and the whole process becomes ritualized so that any type of addiction, um, when they begin fantasizing about the ritual, the mind knows that, and chemicals automatically start reacting before they even take the drug or drink the drink or smoke the cigarette or cut themselves or binge eat and purge. Um, so 
finding that emotional release plus that chemical brain boost, that combination is very attractive to people experiencing some severe emotional pain. So I'm hoping that, and of course therapy would deal with that underlying emotional pain, whatever that is. Uh, so it could be abuse, it could be uh, depression, it could be anxiety, it could be all three. Um, could be, you know, that whole unconditional versus conditional love and acceptance. All of these things are connected. And I'm hoping that with this lecture, you're able to see those connections that that I'm, I'm experiencing as a therapist here. All right. If you have any questions, email me.